Welcome to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. My name's Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True. And I'd love to take a moment to introduce you to the new Sounds True Foundation. The Sounds True Foundation is dedicated to creating a wiser and kinder world by making transformational education widely available. We want everyone to have access to transformational tools such as mindfulness, emotional awareness, and self-compassion, regardless of financial, social, or physical challenges. The Sounds True Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to providing these transformational tools to communities in need, including at-risk youth, prisoners, veterans, and those in developing countries. If you'd like to learn more or feel inspired to become a supporter, please visit SoundsTrueFoundation.org. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. Today is a rebroadcast of one of my favorite episodes. I hope you enjoy it. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. Today I speak with Terry Tempest Williams. Terry is a writer, a naturalist, and an environmental activist and the author of several books, including Finding Beauty in a Broken World, as well as an original audio adaptation of this book, published by Sounds True. I spoke with Terry about her creative process as a writer, and how she has been able to meet directly some of the most traumatic wounding the world can offer, and ultimately, find beauty in a broken world. Here's my conversation with Terry Tempest Williams. So you're here at Sounds True, Terry, recording an original audio abridgment of Finding Beauty in a Broken World. And I'm curious just to begin, when you approached the book, how did you consider how to abridge it? Your recording here is, what, one third of the book, something like that? Right. I love editing. And I also love reworking material. So it's been a great gift and privilege to be able to take these three sections in Finding Beauty in a Broken World, the Mosaic section, the Prairie Dog section, and the Rwanda section, and condense each section into an hour. So in many ways, it's forced me to be much clearer, um, to be sharper on the connections that are held and to see how each section speaks to the next. It's also fascinating to realize that what works on the page with the reading mind is very different from what is articulated verbally and what gets translated and what gets lost. And the ear tells you that. And with Randy Rourke, such a great producer, um, we're constantly in eye contact and we can read each other. And Mm -hmm. it's like slash burn this. You know, and then something else that I didn't think was as strong on the page might be stronger um, through the voice. So it's been a wonderful re-exploration of the written word to the spoken word. I can imagine some writers who might feel, you know, no, I can't leave anything out. Are you kidding me? You know, ev- every word is ceremony, whatever. How am I going to leave this out? But you haven't had that feeling at all? You know, it could be argued that it's better as an audio book than oh, interesting. a physical book. There's a hundred pages of prairie dog observations. In yeah, the, that, that was a part that I skimmed over a little bit exactly. there at a certain point. Yeah. And my father, yeah. when I gave him this book, yeah. you know, and I knew he would be honest with me because he's brutal. Yeah. He's the one that at a dinner table said, Terry, I'm so glad you have a hobby. And I thought, hobby, um, croquet, yeah. tennis, yeah. oh, writing. You know, he read this and he said, Terry, the prairie dog section is so boring no one's going to get through it. And if they do the rest of the book, such a downer, they'll be sorry they did. (laughs) So I'm excited to give him the audio version. And I don't think anything is lost um, by not having those prairie dog notes read. I do think something's gained on the page in that it creates a meditative space for the reader Uh um, to think about prairie dogs and to slow down the mind. It also opens the mind and heart for what is to come which is Rwanda. Um, How we do that in the audio form, I think, has to do with developing empathy through the voice, so then that that will carry the reader into the harrowing 
aspects of Rwanda. What do you mean finding empathy through the voice? We live fast, we speak fast, oftentimes we don't listen. And I think the gift of working with Sounds True is that there's a sensibility to the realm of the spirit, to the energetic impulse that one has, um, what's said beyond the words. So I think what's very important to me in the production of Finding Beauty in a Broken World are the silences, Mm -hmm. the spaces. I think the spaces in between the passages are as important as the words themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think in those spaces you have contemplation, you have consideration, you have empathy. Now, can you tell the person who's unfamiliar with finding beauty in a broken world, just briefly, what each of these three sections are about and how they fit together? That was another criticism my father had. You know, what in the world do prairie dogs have to do with the Rwandan genocide? And in truth, it's also been a criticism. And finding beauty in a broken world really was born out of the heat of September 11th. I was in Washington, D.C., I was at the Corcoran Gallery. Um, We were told, I was there for a press conference with um, seven photographers, eight photographers. The Nature Conservancy was sponsoring an exhibit called In Response to Place. To make a long story short, the guard came in, said the Twin Towers have been hit, the Pentagon's been struck, we have reason to believe the White House is next run. And we continued talking. There was nothing in our psyche, imagination, that could accommodate what had just been said. Mm -hmm. He ran back in, said, what didn't you hear? We ran out onto the street, gridlock. You could see the black plume rising. I couldn't get home to the American West, to Utah. And in those five, six days that I was wandering the streets of Washington, I saw how quickly the rhetoric in our country changed to one of fear and terror. Mm -hmm. And I made a decision, Tammy, as a writer, as a citizen, that I would speak out. And I did. And I heard myself saying things like, there are many forms of terror, and terrorism, environmental degradation is among them. I wrote op-ed pieces for the New York Times. Uh, I was relentless. I think that was the thing that scared me the most, is that my rhetoric had become as hollow and brittle as those I was opposing. Hmm. I went to Maine. It was almost a year to the date of September 11th. I went down to those blessed blue waters and call it a prayer or a plea. And I said, give me one wild word, and I promise I will follow. And the word I heard... In my own heart, the word that the sea rolled back to me was mosaic. Mm. And so this book became an exploration of mosaic. I thought mosaic was a craft. That was my thought. So when you you heard the word mosaic, it didn't automatically, the whole book didn't unfold at that point and make sense to you. It was more like a clue that you got? Honestly, I was disappointed. Uh I thought, great, coming out of Mormon culture, um, I'm relegated now to a life of crafts, which I do not do well. (laughs) And I thought, you know, I'll be taking my mother's dinner plates, breaking them and baking (laughs) making bad picture frames. That was my ignorance. Uh You know, I I took it seriously. I mean, it was a vow. And I ended up going to Italy, studying mosaics at what I thought would be a craft course, I walked in, in 30 seconds I realized I was way in over my head. It was a very sophisticated, high-level mosaic workshop for conservators and mosaicists of, I don't even have the words, the the quality of these individuals. My teacher, Luciana, recognized me faster than I recognized that I was over my head and relegated me to the corner where I broke stone for the other artists Uh for three weeks. Uh Um, So I learned a lot. I learned there are rules in mosaic. I learned that mosaic is not a craft, but an art form, a form of integration. And it changed the way I saw the world. I remember Luciana, her last statement to us after the three weeks, she said, mosaics are a way of thinking about the world. Mosaics are created out of community. And when I came home, you know, we live in Castle Valley, Utah, part of the Colorado Plateau, the Red Rock Desert of southern Utah. And I remember driving through the Cisco Desert and seeing that beautiful horizon line Mm. that I've known since birth. Suddenly I saw it as a horizontal line in mosaic. And one of the rules of mosaic is if you're creating a horizontal line, place tessera vertically. Mm. And I saw a vertical tessera 
it was a prairie dog. Yeah. And suddenly I saw my own home ground as an ecological mosaic, broken and beautiful. How did I get from prairie dogs to Rwanda? And what I would argue, you know, what's the connection? How can you equate the plight of a prairie dog to the Rwandan genocide? And what I would argue, Tammy, is that the extermination of a species, mm -hmm. the extermination of a people, are predicated on the same impulses. Prejudice, cruelty, arrogance and ignorance, circling around issues of, of power and justice. So that's the link. I did not know where I was going. Um, I could never have imagined that in that moment, give me one wild word, that it would have led me to Italy, that it would have allowed me to see my home differently with prairie dogs as Tessera. I could never have imagined that the word mosaic would have led me to create with other barefoot artists under the instruction of Lily Ye in a genocide village on the border of Rwanda and Congo, that that one wild word, mosaic, would have led me to work on a, a genocide memorial, creating mosaics literally out of the rubble of war. Hmm. So in many ways it's a book about faith, of, of following our, our yeah. questions, our desire. Um, well, that's what I was going to ask you because it uh, brings forth an interesting metaphysics hmm. that we pray, we hear something that is disappointing or incomprehensible or whatever. And I mean, you followed it like this. So what, what does it bring up for you in terms of how this world works? Like the, the future was coming to you in a, you know, 10 years previously before you went, I mean, how do you understand it? I don't think I do. I think what I have come to appreciate, which maybe leads to understanding, is that it's about presence. It's, it's one step at a time. It's really following that word day by day by day. And in mm. this case, over a period of eight years, you know, um, I never dreamed that those bejeweled ceilings in Ravenna, you know, looking at Apollo, the sun god, transformed through time to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that then in Rwanda I would be working with mosaics at a genocide memorial with Louis Gakumba, our translator, who would become our son. I mean, how can you make any sense of that except for gratitude and trust and faith that we can't know what our path is? Hmm. All we can do is... Um, make choices as opportunities arise. And, you know, initially when Lily Ye, who's a Chinese-American artist and mosaicist who lives in Philadelphia, when she asked if I would accompany her to Rwanda to be her scribe in this organization called Barefoot Artists, yeah. I said no. My brother had just passed away from lymphoma. You know, our own family was broken. I was broken. The last thing I wanted to do was yeah. to go to Rwanda, a country so familiar with death. I also was afraid, I'll be honest, and I, f I felt complicit in what had occurred. I did nothing, yeah. um, along with many, many other Americans, but Lily never took her eyes off me. How oh, interesting. And I heard myself say yes, and I think on some fundamental level I knew that my own sense of humanity depended on that answer. Hmm. Now, you mentioned Louis, who became your son. What happened there? Um, Louis Gakumba, I met him when he was 22. He was our translator, and I worked very close with him. He was my eyes, my ears, my heart. Um, he told me he'd never met a human being that asked so many questions. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine. And we were really close. And I remember one day saying, Louis, what are you learning through translation? He'd never translated before, even though he spoke six languages. You know, English, French, Kinyarwanda, Burundi, um, dialects from the Congo, Swahili. He was working for a, a South African mining company, articulating metals through microscope. And Jean Bosco, who was the coordinator from the Red Cross, knew that Louis spoke English. And he said, you've got to be my translator with these Americans who are coming. And it was amazing to watch him grow into his job as a translator. And he became really, really good. And it was clear that something else was at work then. He was very intuitive and very compassionate. And one day I said, Louis, what are you learning? 
as a translator. And he said, I'll tell you tomorrow. And he came back the next day, jumped into the vehicle, sat down and said, I have my answer. I had almost forgotten the question I had asked. And then he said, translation is not about words. It's about hunger. Hmm. And I am articulating your hunger and hmm. translating the hunger of those you're working with. Hmm. And those shared hungers create an understanding. I love that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, Louis never asked for anything. And when I was leaving that first trip, I just said, tell me what you desire. You know, what's your dream as a Rwandan? And he said, my dream is after I have put my brothers and sisters through school, paid for their school fees, I would love to be able to get my own education. Louis had not been to school since the third grade because of the war. And to make a long story short, we were able to find him a scholarship, um, a sponsor, which I will tell you happens to be my father. We didn't have enough money to be able to meet the needs of the State Department. Yeah. And that was set. What we couldn't get was a visa. It's very difficult. And the State Department demands that you have money and that you own land. Well, very few genocide survivors have either. Yeah. And Louis finally stated his case powerfully what he did have. Yeah. And we had been working together with the consulate. I finally called and said, where are we on Louis Kakumba's visa? This was after they said, would you put your name down so that if anything goes awry, you're held accountable? I just yeah. said, of course. Um, where are we on Louis's visa? He picked it up yesterday. We were in Rwanda the next day. We went into the village, and in Gaseni, um, to our great surprise, we found ourselves in a ceremony with his parents. And his mother turned to me and said, I am Louis's biological mother. You will now be his developmental mother. Hmm. Educate him. Hmm. And we realized we were in a transfer ceremony, and she gave us her son. And at the end, I was saying, you know, I just kept thinking, maybe this isn't the right thing. You know, how can you let your son go? And she just turned to me with Louis translating hesitantly hmm. and said, um, God loves my son more than I do. Wow. And he's been here in America for two years. He's graduating in the spring yeah. um, from Salt Lake Community College with associate degree. He will then, he wants to go on in international relations at the University of Utah. And um, what I can tell you, Tammy, is on May 16th, we are formally adopting him as our son in the state of Wyoming. It has no bearing on his relationship with his parents yeah. in Rwanda, but it's a symbolic act, I think, for us as his American family to recognize what's here. Um, it will help security-wise yeah. for him yeah. if he finds himself back in Rwanda during the war, another war. God help us that that won't happen. Yeah. But um, we just felt on many levels, both symbolic, spiritual, and practical, that this was a wonderful thing to, mm. to do, a reconfiguration of family, mm -hmm. a mosaic. Mm -hmm. No one could have been more surprised than me. You know, we've been childless by choice, and suddenly after 35 years of marriage, Brooke and I find ourselves with the most beautiful son imaginable. Mm. Now, you know, finding beauty, of course, I think it's easy for someone to think of how to find beauty in a mosaic that's been created by an artist, but the extinction of prairie dogs and the genocide in Rwanda I'm curious what eyes you had to look through to find beauty in these situations. It's a great question. You know, um, a dear friend of mine said, you're married to sorrow. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not married to sorrow. I just choose not to look away. And. I think there's deep beauty in not averting our gaze. No matter how hard it is, no matter how heartbreaking it can be, you know, watching prairie dogs shot, um, standing before the, a mass grave of 30,000 human beings that were murdered by hand by Hutu extremists with farm tools, machetes and hoes. Um, again, Tammy, I think it's about presence, bearing witness, 
I used to think bearing witness was a passive act. I don't believe that anymore. I think that when we are present, when we bear witness, when we do not avert our gaze, something is revealed. You know, the, the very marrow of life. Um, we change. A transformation occurs. A consciousness shift. I think that when we are fully present, we witness something, our consciousness shifts, our actions reflect that shift, and we behave differently. The prairie dogs, you know, when I was doing prairie dog observations, my task as a scribe was to write down what I saw in 15-minute intervals. Sometimes nothing went on for a long, long time, and then suddenly this whole world opened up, and, you know, prairie dog... Um, RR6, you know, who I ended up becoming Madam Head Wide Apart. You know, how can you not find beauty when in watching what prairie dogs do, we had to watch their um, home burrows um, first thing in the morning. So we had to be there probably about 5.30, half an hour before the sun would rise in the summer. The prairie dogs would come up, they would face the rising sun, and for 30 minutes, they would press their palms together in utter and absolute stillness. Hmm. And then they would go on their day. And then 30 minutes or so before the sun would set, they would return to their home burrows. They would face west again, palms pressed together in utter stillness. And then retreat underground. Beauty, even in a broken world. The women in Rwanda, eyes turned inward, a suffering so deep and severe I could not comprehend what they still hold, having watched their children butchered before them. And yet, those women are caring for other children. Um, those women are working in the fields. Over 50% of the women in Rwanda are now in Parliament. You know, 50% of Parliament are women, I should say. Um, making mosaics, taking that which is broken and creating something whole. There is such deep beauty in that. Eyes turned inward that suddenly become, or over time, I should say, become eyes turned outward. So I think at the root of any joy, there are those seeds of suffering. And um, it's what makes us human. I think it's what allows us to, to fully embrace our lives, shared with other. I can imagine, though, uh, someone maybe more like me who would look at something like this extinction of the prairie dogs or the genocide in Rwanda or other atrocities and at a certain point go into kind of like a trauma response, if you will, and being like, yeah, I know there's beauty in that, but I... I'm turning away because this just hurts too much. And I did. You know, I mean, in the sense, when I came home, I mean, I didn't have the luxury to turn away when we were there because we were there to do work as, as community. And I think that's the other thing I learned, is that there's such dignity in work. And really, that's my definition of faith. You know, I remember my great-grandmother, who is Mormon, um, said to me, faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. And I think what I learned through working in Rwanda together, Hutu, Tutsi, Rwandans, Americans, that there's great faith in doing good work together. You don't know what the outcome is going to be, but you're in relationship, and, and there's something very creative that is happening. When I came home, that's when my trauma emerged. It was almost like, you know, delayed post-traumatic stress syndrome. And I, I went through nothing. I mean, I was a privileged American being there. Yeah. Um, so it's all relative. But I think I realized how fully I had changed when I came back to Jackson Hole. My husband and I were asleep in this cabin. Um, it was fall. I've heard elk bugle my entire life as a Westerner. And an elk started bugling at dawn. I rose in absolute sweat thinking, you know, I heard it as a human scream. Mm hmm that was not in my frame of reference prior to Rwanda. Mm -hmm. So you had a commitment, though, that you were going to go through the process, this process of bearing witness, to create something. I went 
to serve Lily as her scribe. Uh -huh. And I was part of a team. And we were there to help build this genocide memorial with the Rugerara Genocide Survivors Village. So that was our work. In the meantime, we were working with children. We were painting the houses. You know, we were really, really busy all the time. But at night, you know, the only thing that separated me from my absolute terror of sensing those ghosts of what had gone on in the very room I was sleeping, you know, we were right next to the prison where the prisoners, the genocidaires, were walking by every single day in their pink suits. The only thing separating me from me and my own madness and, and absolute terror was a green mosquito net that was barely hanging. So, you know, I'm not telling you the truth if I say that I wasn't scared all the time. Hmm. And again, we were perfectly safe. There was yeah. no war. Yeah. It was the aftermath of war. Yeah. The ghosts, um, the stories, the bones, always the bones, always the bones. You realized in Rwanda there was not one square inch of that country, that land that had not been bled on or bled over. And you felt that every single minute. Mm -hmm. Except when you were with the children. And, you know, it was Louis who said, you cannot rob the children of their joy. I mean, they would be singing, they would be dancing, and yet you know that those children are suffering, that they're hungry, that they're sick, that, you know, many of them have HIV. So it's this total paradox that you're living with at such a, a heightened state. Now, you know, what's interesting to me is as you're talking, you're um, describing how in the midst of terror, you were able, by not turning away, to see the, the beauty in it. And yet one of our acquiring editors here at Sounds True, she said to me, uh, you know, I was reading an interview someplace else with Terry Tempest Williams, and there's this great quote you should ask her about. Beauty is the beginning of terror. Hmm. Now, since you're, we're talking about mosaics, I'm sure it can go both ways, but looking at it in that direction, here you are looking at something beautiful. Now, I don't know if you remember saying this. In you know, Rilke, but... it's a quote from Rilke, oh, actually. Okay. And I think about that a lot, because there were times... You know how it is when you're in the midst of such a, a deep connection or a conversation or, you know, whether it's watching, you know, the prairie dog pups emerge and suckling from their mother's breasts and, you know, communal nursing. And you just think, this is so exquisite that your heart aches. Yeah. You know, or when, you know, I remember, and again, this does not speak well of me, but after I learned how to say hello and thank you, in Kenya Rwanda, the next thing I learned was, please move back. Yeah. I was terrified I was going to get sick. I was terrified I was going to get some horrible disease from the children. I mean, it's the American obsession with hygiene, you know? Yeah. And by the time I left Rwanda, I did not have enough arms to hold all those children. You know, mm. what happened? What's that shift? And I think it has to do with beauty which is love, which is presence, which is seeing the world beyond yourselves, beyond yourself and your own selfish concern. I mean, the truth be told, we were the ones that received the gifts, yeah, not the village. And in that sense, it's very selfish. I guess when I heard that quote, beauty is the beginning of terror, additionally to what you're saying, what I associated with it was some idea that in times of great beauty, there's some type of dissolving of our self-boundaries, in a way. Isn't that interesting? Huh. You know, the, ter you the terror of um, we're not in control anymore, the, the vastness of the situation, that, that kind of thing. I love that. You know, you also made me think about, you know, there's terror, T-E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, and yeah. then terror. Beauty is the beginning of terror. That there is a tearing of the fabric of what you've yeah. known. That there's a beautiful artist named Margaret Card, and she created this wonderful canvas that she beaded, and and then the fab this beaded fabric is torn, and you see this um, beautiful galaxy that is exposed, and she calls it tasting stars. Mm. And I think you know there's something to what you were saying about that. Yeah, and in the context of this conversation, in a world where we find the amount of brokenness that we find, 
What do you think the role of the artist is? And is it different today than maybe it was in a different time in history? Or do you think that the artist always performs this kind of function of showing beauty and brokenness? Or do you think that in our world today, there's kind of a special mandate for artists? What a good question. You know, I can only speak personally. Yeah. Um, I don't know anything. And I've never been more aware of that than in writing this book. Um, and what I, I realized is whatever I thought I knew was shattered. Whatever I anticipated never happened. And what I never anticipated did in the full range. Um, so again, it, it goes back in, in very simple terms that it's, it's simply a witnessing. Um, you know, a sharing of, of what I saw and what I felt and what I learned. And I think what I learned through that one wild word is that finding beauty in a broken world is creating beauty in the world we find. Mm -hmm. And when Lily and I were standing on the edge of that mass grave and I turned to her and I said, what do we do? She just looked straight ahead and said, I don't know, but we will do something. Mm -hmm. So in the end, it's, you know, what's, what's the action? What's our commitment to act? You know, what are we going to create? both individually and together, in the name of community. And I think that's the exploration in this book. Is that the role of the artist? Perhaps. Um, you know, as a writer, it's what you and I were talking about before. It's, for me, it's living in the heart of experience, having the guts to follow where you're led, and being crazy enough to stay to stay mm -hmm. in that level of discomfort and come home and reflect and pick up your pencil and uh, start moving it across the paper and see mm -hmm. what comes. Now, I, I read in some of the interviews with you online last night that when you sit at your writing desk, you light a candle. And it, for whatever reason, you know, <laughs> I don't know how many interviews cited this fact and Part of what I thought was, why is this so remarkable? Like, why do people think it's so remarkable? Yet here I am talking about it myself. I find it remarkable, too. And I love that it sounds true. The minute I walked into the studio, there were candles lit everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, I said to Randy and Aaron, I mean, this is a cared-for space. It's, you know, to me, when you light a candle, you acknowledge that that transformation has occurred. You know, a spark has been lit. And for me, when I sit down to write, it's acknowledging that I am now in a different space, yeah. both physically and mentally. You yeah. know, I also have a glass of, or a bowl of water, which I've mentioned, you know, and it could be said that then if the candle falls over on the paper, you know, I can douse it, but yeah. that's not it. It's that, you know, how many days, weeks go by where you're sitting at your desk and nothing happens? Well, something's happening. The water's drawing down in an act of evaporation, and I find that very encouraging. So what, what I'm curious about is here you are, you're lighting a candle, you have this water, and you have faith in something or other that's going to happen through you. I mean, what, what, how do you understand the process of language and creation coming through you? Because you have such a unique way of seeing the world. And I'm, I'm curious how you, if you turn that unique way of seeing outward onto your actual process as a writer, what that looks like. I mean, on one hand, you know, writing is really blue collar work. I mean, you show up, it's physical labor, you're working with your hands, um, you know, certainly in conjunction with your mind. That's part of it. I mean, I think writing is about labor. Mm -hmm. And I often, you know, my father and I and my brothers, we always laugh a lot. And they go, you are not a laborer. Yeah. You know, because, you know, they work in pipeline construction. It's shovel, it's trench, it's dirt. It's, and I think it's similar. You know, they're, they're creating gas lines, you know, water lines. 
Um, no, I you're think, explaining to me why I don't like writing that much. You know, you know? I mean, I'd much rather speak. It doesn't seem anywhere near like the kind you know, of labor. Writing, anyway. You know, writing, you're creating infrastructure. Yeah. I think for community. So on one hand, it's a very physical act. You show up, you know, and you have a task. On the other hand, writing is also a spiritual practice for me. It's how I come to know the world. It's how I make peace with my own contradictory nature. If I'm honest, um, it is about creating community. And it's, it's trying to make sense of the world that at times make no, makes no sense at all. So that's the candle, you know, that I want to be attentive to what comes. And I hope as a writer I have a courage, enough courage to write what I may not dare speak. And I love Helena Sixou. Um, she's a French writer. And she says, as women, we must learn to speak the language women speak when there's no one there to correct us. Mm. So that's in my mind. But I think in the end, you know, the writing that I admire most um, has to do with story. Mm-hmm. Being a storyteller. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, story bypasses rhetoric and pierces the heart and we feel it. And again, I think that's most powerfully conveyed through the human voice. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the privileges and pleasures of working with Sounds True is is you really get to embody the storyteller as you speak the words rather than just write them on the page. Mm -hmm. Now you said, if I were honest, I would say that writing is about creating community. So I'm curious about two parts of that. First of all, how does you, do you see that your writing creates community? And then secondly, why, like, if you were honest, like, why is that uh, uh, going an edgy thing to say? You're such a good listener. Um, I think you have to understand where I come from. I come out of a Mormon community. And in many ways, every time I speak, I feel like I'm breaking set with the community that I was come from. Uh-huh. You know, the community that I was a part of. Yeah. Because in my generation, in many ways, women... Um, at least as I understood it, you know, women did not speak truth to power. Um, You certainly didn't question the status quo. And it feels so often when I'm writing, I am questioning the status quo. Yeah. I am addressing an issue that has to do with power and politics, whether it's oil and gas leases in canyon lands or, um, you know, prairie dogs. So there's that. Because in writing to create community, I'm also severing aspects of community. Mm-hmm. I think the, yeah. the irony as a writer is in order to create community, you're pulled out of community to do the writing yeah. because ultimately writing is a solitary act. Yeah. You're a solitary and laborer. You know, and <laughs> it's, a, it's presumptuous to think that, that you can create community. You don't know. I've never seen anyone read one of my books. I have no idea. Uh-huh. But I know the, the writer's who have brought me into a sense of community. That when I'm reading them in the margins, I write, yes, thank you, exactly. You know, when there were times where I just thought, is anyone else thinking this? Mm-hmm. You know, am I the only one that, that cares about this idea? So I think writers make us feel less lonely in the world. And I would hope that, that my writing can do the same for others, as other writers have done for me. Mm-hmm. Be it Rachel Carson, Virginia Woolf, um, Denise Levertov, you know, Wallace Stegner, um, Coetzee, I could go on and on about all the writers who have changed and altered and um, expanded my life. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to circle back to, to something. You know, you, you said this friend of mine says, you know, I'm addicted to sorrow. And you said, no, that's not true. Married to sorrow. Married, sorry. Mm-hmm. Married to sorrow. You said, no, that's not true. I'm just willing to kind of stick with it. And uh, in the meditation tradition in which I've been trained, there's these three words, never turn away, Hmm. never turn away. And so as you were talking about that, I was thinking of those three words, never turn away. Hmm. And the question that emerged for me is, for you, how do you do that? How do you not turn away? Yeah. Such a great question. The word that comes back to my mind again and again is being present. If you are present, then there's no past, as you well know. There's no future. You're there. And whether it's being with a family member who's dying, you are present with them. You are breathing. And in that breathing, there is this commitment and communion to that breath, presence. Um, And you don't look away. 
you know, you it's this shared gaze. Um, mm-hmm. My friend's dog just passed away on Monday, and she asked if I would come um, as they as she was about to put him down da- her down, and we wa- I walked in and and there was Lynn, there was Cola, and we just knelt down with Cola, and we just started breathing. You're present, um, and I think when you're present. Fear is still there, but you're moving with it. You're moving, you're breathing with it. Mm -hmm. It's the only way I can describe it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think we go where we're called. Mm -hmm. And for one reason or another, I was called to Rwanda. I have felt a deep communion with prairie dogs since I was, you know, since I have a memory, because my family shot them. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, why? Mm -hmm. And so there was an affinity there. Yeah. So again, it, again, that word empathy. Yeah. And I, when I think about the, you know, the times in my life that I've had regrets, it's never when I stayed. It's always when I left. Yeah. It's never what I did so much as what I didn't do. Yeah. So I think it's that, that desire to be fully present and having both the curiosity and the mind to try and understand the mysteries that, that, that surround us that we wear as loose clothing in our lives. Now, this conversation series that we're having is called, technically, Insights at the Edge. Hmm. And the thing I'm curious about is, we'll start with your your work in the world, your writing. What the current edge is for you, this moment? I was nervous for our conversation. You know, that's an edge. I think whenever you enter truth with another person, um, I hope that I can be present and and be honest in that expression. Um, there's an edge to the adult adoption we're about to enter. You know, on April 16th, how is that going to change things? You know, to me, this is a bigger commitment than my marriage to Brooke. We've been married 35 years. I always know with Brooke we can get divorced. You know, it's a it's a daily commitment. I can't imagine that with a child, you know, I mean, and even though Louis's not a child, he's an adult, but, you know, this is a huge commitment, and it scares me. Mm-hmm. So that's the edge that I'm standing on right now, is, you know, I'm about to become a mother, you know, and that has always terrified me. And so it's a legal term, you know, I mean, will he call me mum? You know, I've said, just yeah. call me Terry. You know, so it's these things that I think are the private things that we hold in our hearts that we don't really talk about. That's an edge. I don't know, writing-wise, where I'm going next. I never do. You know, I wait for a question that obsesses me and keeps me up at night. I'm interested in women. You know, I have, I, uh, my mother and grandmother have been gone 20 years. And I think it's time for me to go back um, into the place of the feminine, and mm. I can feel, you know, I think that's where I want to go next, I think, is really explore what the feminine is, because I think that we have to um, go into, I'm just, I'm interested in what we know as women, mm. and I need to go back into that place, mm-hmm. and rediscover, you know, what does it mean to be a mother now? Why have I been afraid of it? Um, and I've always felt, you know, you don't have to give birth physically to children to have them be your children. So there's a lot of questions I'm thinking about personally. I'm interested in texts, you know, the texts that I've been reading and how by women and what, what they hold. Um, I've just been rereading a lot of Helena Sixou's Promethea mm-hmm. about love and what fuels us, again, what we turn away from. Um, Krista Wolf, uh, Julia Kristeva, um, powerful women. You know, Wangari Mathai just has written a book, uh, The Problem with Africa. So I'm interested in women's voices right now, and maybe because I want to return to my own deeper feminine. What, what might that mean to you, your own deeper feminine? I don't know. I don't know. I think after the Bush and Cheney era, I am just so tired of... The politics of oil and gas and, you know, I mean, if I told you how many forests I've killed by what I've written, you know, how many endless reams of paper I've used um, in 
polemics. So I want, you know, just in the same way that I was desperate to retrieve my poetry. Yeah. I think now I really want to explore what do we have to give as women um, to this next era, both mm. politically as well as spiritually. You know, climate change. What's our role as women as we think about um, where we're heading as, as a people on a planet that's heating up? Um, you know, just these, I'm, I'm just exploring, so I really don't know. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the honest answer, but there's clues when I'm thinking about yeah. um, what I'm reading and what I'm thinking about, and my own struggle. It's always tied, I think, to the questions that keep me up at night. Yeah. How about and you? I mean, do you mind me asking? I mean, what edge are you standing on? Uh, being fully myself, especially in public, without worrying about the echo. And have you not always been? I haven't been that public. I've sort of hid behind hmm. spiritual teachers and people like you. So coming forward and being able to do it without any concern of the internet echo, mm -hmm. any echo, mm -hmm. because then, you know, I'm spending my time, you know, looking at myself through other people's eyes instead of just being. Mm 